Welcome everyone to this um, second um, EAL webinar um, in the EAL webinar series. Um, I want to welcome Julian Lavon, who will be presenting today. Um, I also like, want to welcome and thank Chris as well for all the IT support. Um, so um, Julian is going to be talking to you about task-based learning, teaching and learning. Um, the um, actual webinar will be recorded and will be available on the Moodle site. So um, you're, wel you're welcome to peruse um, afterwards. So I think a, a few other people have joined us. So I don't know, if Chris, if you want to just check. Nice check. Yeah. yeah. Julian is quickly becoming an expert here in the end, so he's going to be walking along. Um, I'll get you to just real quick. Yep. Take it, take, take it away. Yep. <clears throat> Oh, look at that, that's close. There's Julian, all right, great. <laughs> right, uh, you're up. Excellent. There you go. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon and for taking the time um, to attend this webinar. My name is Julian Longfun. Um, I've been a teacher now for over 20 years in many parts of the world. Uh, I'm also a, a, a Cambridge teacher trainer working on primary, secondary and adult courses for teachers. And I currently work at St. Mary's University um, at the Language Center where I'm the actor academic manager, um, amongst many other responsibilities. So today we're going to be talking about um, task-based learning, um, but to, before we do, I'd just like to know a little bit more about, about those of you attending. So I'm going to pop up this survey here, which I'm going to start now, and if you don't mind, if you could just spend a, a minute or so um, going through these three questions, it probably should take you about, about a minute. And we'll keep an eye on that. The first test of the platform, isn't it really? There we go. So we're seeing the results come in as you're clicking through the survey. Ooh, look at that. That's interesting. This is where I get to see if the activities I've prepared here actually match the people attending. <laughs> CBU, oh cool, and Sintel High School, and uh, can I scroll down here, can I? Just move down, substitute teacher, EAL, we have Wolfville, welcome to people in the valley, Lower Sackville, Great. So lots of lots of variety. EAL academic, EAL literacy, pedagogy classes. Excellent. Lower Sackville. Okay. Do we know if everyone's gone through it or not? Um, okay. Let's give you a few more seconds. <clears throat> okay, excellent. Good. So hopefully some of the things we're going to be doing today you'll find interesting and, and usable. So I'm just going to end that. That's ending, is it? Yeah. I'm just going to end the uh, the survey there so that we can move on. Great, thank you very much. Okay, so, oops, wrong uh, So today, um, what I'd like to get through is first of all briefly go through why planning for a learner centered classroom um, is considered good practice. Um, what do we understand by a, a task based approach um, to teaching and learning? Uh, we're going to go through some examples of tasks that can be used at various ages, um, and we'll reflect on those as we go through, and then hopefully we'll have some time at the end for, um, for a QA. And I'll try and help as much as I can in that. Um, you'll also be asked to participate at times, so we're going to try a few things out. And I'll say this when we get to it, but at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a blue ribbon where I'm. You may see me highlighting. That? Oh, the pointer. There we go. So down at the bottom of the. No, you won't see that, okay. So at the bottom of the screen, there is a, there's a ribbon and there's a one that says T. If you hover over that, it says text. So I'll be giving you some information on how you can type onto the screen as we go through. Okay, so 
bring people into the activity as we go. Okay, so let's move into why plan for a learner center classroom. So here are some of the reasons why a learner center classroom or task-based approach is considered good practice. Um, so for example, at all stages of the lesson, students must use their language resource to complete tasks. B, the de uh, to develop and facilitate cooperation in the classroom. And then C, students spend more time working in pairs and or small groups. D, the teacher has more time to, uh, to support the students as a result of C. Um, and then E, it is enjoyable and motivating um, for students and hopefully for teachers too. Um, and you may have come across other um, reasons yourself. So let's have a look then at these. Which reason for you um, would you say is the most important thing to you? And just pop your ideas into the chat box. You can just put, you don't have to type it out, just put A, B, C, D, E, or if there's another idea, you can add your idea with F. And we'll have a look at what's, oh, there we go. So the chat box is on the bottom left corner, and you'll see a little text field where you can add a note and send it to the public. So all of us can see. Oops, you can select A, B, C, D, E, or F. Thank you, Susan Jones. Thank you. E. E, A, and E. This is an eye test for me now. E. <laughs> e. Thank you. Okay. Sarah and Jen. Yeah, there's no right answer. I'll give you choosing a few. There you go. Enjoyable and motivating. Yes, certainly hope so. Great. Okay, so I think we're all we're all on board with a learner centered classroom. So let's move forward then into thinking what do we mean by a task? So I'll, I'll hand over to you again. Um, what do you understand by the word task. What is a task? If you were asked that question, how would you answer it? Well, great, you're ahead of me. Fantastic, engage activity, good, yeah. Okay. So engage is a good word. that the kids do on their own, okay. Based on learning outcomes, very good, yeah. Activity that gets the students to participate. Sorry, you just see me squinting at the screen here, that's okay. The ideas are great. Uh, when you ask students to present information, they have learned. Thank you, an activity that puts knowledge into practice, great. Good, yeah. So. students can accomplish. Good, yes. So some of these, this is a, I'm going to go through just a few of the um, definitions, if you like, of what characterizes it as a task. So here we have the primary focus should be on meaning, which is referring to communication is, uh, is what we're concerned with most. There should be some kind of gap, and this was mentioned in the chat box as well. So for example, um, there are three types of uh, of gaps, an information gap where students have different information, missing information and they need to get together in order to get that information to complete the task. Um, an opinion gap is um, when we're looking at students' feelings or opinions and, and sharing them as a way of bridging that gap between how people feel and what they think. Um, reasoning gaps uh, tend to be things around problem solving inferring and deducing. So taking some information and doing something with it. Students should rely on their own language resources and experiences in order to complete the activity which we mentioned at the beginning with a, a learner center classroom. And as some, as some of you wrote in the chat box, there should be a defined outcome or purpose to complete the activity. And the good thing about doing that is then you're raising that motivation and enjoyment. Okay, so good. We've gone through all that. I think we're all on the same page there. So let's jump straight into an activity. Um, 
And these ones can be used with young children. And some of you may have tried this before yourself. So let's have a look at it. So in some classes, I'd give um, students uh, tap, uh, some cards one to nine that they have a set of, but they only use um, a few of them at a time. So in this case, um, I've chosen four cards. And the aim of this is to, um, to practice their math skills as well as develop their thinking and reasoning skills and, uh, through the language, using the language of math. So here we've got four cards, a three, four, eight, and seven. Um, and we're going to use only, a, what we're going to have to do is ask the students some questions, and then they have to show us the answer. Um, ordinarily in a classroom, teaching children, they might be shouting, shouting out the answers. This way gives the, uh, the children a bit more thinking time, and then you can actually see um, who's getting the answers correct and who, who needs more time. So if we treat these as individual numbers, um, I will start really easy, um, as this is for, for young children. Um, can you show me an odd number? And feel free to type it. Just humor me for a second on this one. I know it's late in the day. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay. Show me a number that's more than that's uh, one more than six. There we go. Good. Yeah. And this is these again. Show me a number between six and eight. Which you've already got. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So we've got the language of math in there that we're using with the. Uh, with the students. Now we can, um, using as many numbers as you like, write down the largest odd number you can make. So write down the largest odd number you can make. And the you can make instruction is, is important because you're going to have students with varying levels of difficulty. That we've got an 87. Nice. Well, there's a nice big one, 834. Four. Is that an odd number? I'm not sure about that. 843, yes, we've got an odd number there, 8,743, yes, okay. Good, so you can see now the, the challenge is getting a little bit higher. Um, one more task with this then, what is the largest multiple of three that you can make? The largest multiple of three. And remember, the, the students will be holding up their cards or putting them out so that you can see them. And then the next question, as you go through it, think about how do you know? 66, yeah, that's one. But although we can't have a 66, we have to use these numbers here. There we go. If you know the trick, if you know the, uh, the way of doing this to check, feel free to type it in the box. Because there is a very, as someone who's not a mathematician, there's a, a very nice way of doing it. 87, yes, that's one. 48, 87, good. Okay, great. Now, I'm sure if you teach primary math, then this will be nice and easy. Um, the trick is, with a multiple of three, um, that your num all the digits must add up to three, six, or nine, or or when added together, be a multiple of three. So if we take 87 in that chat box there, eight plus seven is 15, and 15 is a multiple of three. And that's, that's the trick, which I think is quite cool myself. OK, well, let's move on to another activity. Um, that was a show me. This is an odd one out activity. And we've got three more numbers from our pack, 12, 8, and 9. and uh, very simple question to start with. Which one is the odd one out, do you think? And why? Twelve, because it has two digits. Great. Nine is odd. Great. See, you can see there's lots of different reasons. But then having the students tell you why it's the odd one out, again, is the important thing there. Good, so there's, as we can see, there's more than one answer. Excuse me. And this is where, if we jump into the research, has shown that if students can explain why a particular number is the odd one out, then this is the, the most effective way of assessing 
of their, of their learning. Great. Good so far. If you're good so far, feel free to do a thumbs up if you know how to do that. Okay, so um, this is something, are we getting thumbs up? Excellent, great, good. Okay, so we're also, um, this is something that I, I come across, come across uh, quite often um, at, all, at all stages of, it, of, um, of learning, whether it's with primary learners, sec, uh, junior high, secondary, and even with um, professors at university. Um, and it's when I introduce each lesson, my students struggle with the content and tasks. They do not appear to have the language background to participate actively and successfully in lessons. And this isn't only limited, in my experience, with international learners or English language learners. This is also, um, even when students are studying science, science isn't necessarily our first language. So as a way into this, you know, what can we do about it? Um, and if you can see that, this is a, a matrix to show a progression of tasks. And it's useful to, um, to show how we can challenge students to think. And at the bottom there, we have the language demands. And on the left, we have the cognitive demands, which often come, come about as a result of new content. So let's have a look through this in a little bit more detail. And uh, we'll go into how it works. So this is a progression of tasks. If we take task A, we here, we've got low Link, uh, language demands and we've got familiar content. So this is something where we can instill confidence in the students by starting with what students already know. Sounds obvious, but I was flicking through some of my, my son's grade three books and, uh, and it launches quite quickly into content and language that he wouldn't know. So we look for ways of how can we make that more accessible. As we go into B, we can see that the language is getting a little bit more difficult, or the content is getting more difficult. And then as we get into C, the, la the content is becoming newer. And as we get into D, with more complex language, more with newer, co with newer um, content, we can develop this new knowledge through this progression. OK, so let's move on. So this is a good way of. Um, just before, actually before we move on, this is a good way of assessing your own tasks when you're, when you're lesson planning. How difficult is it in terms of the content and how difficult is it in terms of the language that's being used and how can we break that down? So we're going to try an activity, um, brainstorming, which I'm sure you all do and you all know very well. Um, but this, sort, this cooperative brainstorming activity um, is, is designed to also help students with their social skills and to develop their willingness to work with each other. And so we've got this variation on, on a traditional brainstorming um, activity. So for this task, if you have a piece, before we get to um, the text and typing on screen, if you have a piece of paper available, we're going to start there. So in a moment, you'll see this worksheet, or this handout. And first of all, I just want you to work individually, so don't type into the chat box. Just write on your piece of paper, and our topic is unusual animals. I'm just going to give you about a minute just to write down on your piece of paper as many unusual animals that you can think of. OK, so write down on a piece of paper as many unusual animals as you can think of. Okay. When you've, uh, I'll time you, I'll time you a minute. doing that, I'm going to try and type and give you an example. <clears throat> it might say this isn't very, oops, not very unusual, but unusual for here. Good. 
there's mine. Okay, so if you have a list of words, can you just give me a thumbs up? So obviously I can't see what we've got. Yeah. Thank you, John. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. Shelly, yeah. Lucy, thank you. Caitlin, yeah. Thank you. Give us another moment just for the list. <coughs> Good to go? Yeah. Okay, so thank you. You've got a list of unusual animals. Now we're going to try some, because we're not all in a classroom, ordinarily now I would pair um, the students together and they would share their words. Um, we don't have that at the moment, so we're going to go, we're going to break out into some chat rooms in a, mo in, in a minute. What you would do in a classroom is the students would then in pairs share their words. Student A reads out the words they wrote in this column here, in the individual column. Student A reads that to student B. Student B writes any new words in this blue box, in this second box. And then student B reads his or her words to their partner, and student A writes the new words into, into the blue box as well. So at the end, they both have the same words. Okay. If uh, if that if that made sense, put a thumbs up. If that didn't make sense, thumbs down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. That that's good then. So what? So what we're going to do to try and simulate that, we're going to put you into some breakout rooms. When you go in there, have a look at the names that are in your room, and we'll look at surnames, so last names, and we're going to go alphabetically from A. That person is going to go first, and you're going to type your words, oh, where's my pointer? Type your words into this box, okay? The rest of the people in the chat room just have a look at the words that are being written. To type, you click on the text text box and it goes green. And you click on the, the box and then you can start typing. Okay. You may need to change the font size to make it bigger. I'm at 24. When you finish, you click the text box again. All right. So the person who's closest to A, their surname is closest to A, you're going to write your words type your words into that individual box. Okay. And then the next person is going to write their words that are different into box B, into <clears throat> the blue box. Are we getting any? <laughs> okay. So the first, first thing then, let's do that first. We're going to break you into the rooms and the person who is, who's first, who's their, their surname, is closest to A, they're going to go first and type their words into, into box B. Okay, and then I'll pop into the chat rooms to see how you're doing. Should we do that? What's your chat rooms? Are you doing that? And where do I go? Can I go into oh, the top here? Yeah. How many chat rooms are there? Four. Can I see two at the top? That one there? Okay. Okay, so I'm I'm back on. Wonderful. And here, so I'm just going back to my slides. Yeah, I'm back in. Okay, great. Okay, so that was a, a brainstorming uh, variation um, as a way of increasing cooperation and, and uh, interdependence in the classroom. Oh, camera. That one. I'm still here. Okay. Great. So hopefully. That was some uh, connections cutting out there for some people. Okay, so hopefully that was, can I get rid of that? Okay, so let's move on. So that's something that you can do. Um, we have it as unusual animals, so something that can be done with primary, but then the, the technique can still be used for, for older learners as well. 
I'm going to move on to another activity um, that I've used quite a few times before um, around the planets and the solar system. I remember my stepson doing this a few years back when I think he was in grade five, maybe, if I remember correctly. It's a while, while ago now. Um, but when you look at this picture as a way of just creating interest, what sorts of questions could you ask the students? The name of the planet, yeah, there you go. What do you know? Exactly. So um, <coughs> what the activity that we're going to do with this is a running dictation. Order of the planets, that's a good one. And that's actually the type of activity we're going to do. So the students have the picture, and then we're going to do a running dictation. So the students can go into um, groups of twos or threes. Uh, one person is a designated writer. Um, the other one is a runner. And I use runner very carefully. They can only read and speak. Um, if you have a groups of three, then the two non-writers can take turns running, for example. When the time starts, uh, one runner um, from each group, and again runs, um, to where I put the text to describe the planet in the room. They memorize as much text as possible, and then they go back to their writer, and they dictate uh, the sentence back, or as much as they can remember, to their to their partner, and then the writer, of course, writes it down. This continues until the text is complete. So, what I have for this activity are nine sentences, nine statements, if you like, uh, for each of the planets here. Um, and at this point, maybe the students know or don't know um, what what the planets are. So, the idea here, as well, the rules is that they have to get they have to write everything down exactly as it is. So to simulate it in this webinar, I'm, I'm going to do the running, and uh, you're the writers. So you can either write, type it into the chat box, or you can write it on a piece of paper. That's entirely up to you. We're not going to do all nine, just because of um, time, and also because you'll get the idea as we go through. So the first sentence, so if you're ready, the first one, um, maybe a contentious one, but I'll read it out anyway. So A, the first one is, Pluto is the smallest planet, period. It is also called a dwarf planet. So Pluto is the smallest planet, period. It is also called a dwarf planet. I can hear already that it's not a planet. <laughs> so write that down, either on a piece of paper or put it in the chat box if you like. Pluto is the smallest planet, it is also called a dwarf planet. Sentence B, Mercury is the closest planet to the sun. Mercury is the closest planet to the sun. Okay, sentence C, Jupiter is the biggest planet. Mercury is the closest planet. Mercury is the closest planet to the sun. So I just saw the question. And then the other one was Jupiter is the biggest planet. And we'll do one more. Venus is in between Mercury and Earth. Okay, so we would go through that. Obviously, it would take a lot longer um, to go through this. Um, and then the students would have the worksheet that you can now see on your screen. And they would have written out all of the statements, all of the sentences. And then together, they would try and put, using their background knowledge and then also using the language in the sentences, they would try and put the planets, the names of the planets into the into the correct order, or in this case, labeling the, the diagram. Again, because of time, you'll get, you get the idea. I'm not going to get you to do all of this. You don't have all the sentences. You probably even know what the answers are. Um, so on here, you can see we've got Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, 
and Pluto, with a little asterisk next to it. Good, okay. So by doing, well actually we'll come on to that in a second. So also as a way of remembering, I will actually ask you to do this one, um, using mnemonics, which is the first letter of each planet, can you think of an interesting phrase or sentence to help students remember the order, order of the planets? I'll give you a, a few seconds to think of one. Is that one on the bottom? My very early... My very early major standard was nearly perfect. <laughs> My very educated mother just served Oh, I like that one. Yeah, my very educated mother. My Victorian my female mother just slept under nine people. <laughs> <laughs> Those are awesome, eh? Those, those are great. Um, here's, here's one which is similar to what some of you want. My very enthusiastic mother just showed us nine planets. So you get the idea. Um, and there's our to help students remember planets there. So here then, um, using the running dictation activity um, is a way of getting students out of their seats. Um, the idea behind it is to engage uh, reading, writing, listening and speaking. Um, and hopefully a fun way of, of also focusing on language areas as well, which are not always necessarily made explicit. If we look at the, the aims here, for this or the outcomes, we can, our content aim is to differentiate between the planets and the solar system. Our skills aim is by interpreting, transcribing and using descriptors. And then something that's not always included in the outcomes is actually the language involved. So in this case, using comparatives and superlatives. So is bigger than, is the closest to, and locatives, for example, in between. Okay, so hopefully a good way to engage different types of learners as well, um, to add some variety. I would suggest thinking carefully who you have as the runners and who are going to be the writers. And running obviously doesn't have to be literally running around the classroom, especially if you've got big classes. There are ways that you could adapt it where they're pulling out the sentences from an envelope and they have to read it out to their partner, things like that. So you can adapt it that way. But hopefully it's a good way of of adapting if you have a textbook and you have short texts and you want to break it up and make it more accessible and uh, more, more engaging for the learners. And we can look at also along here, if we go back to our matrix here, the progression of tasks, where would you place this, act, the, the actual running dictation, where would you place it on this chart? Would it be in, in A, B, C or D? B. Yeah, B, C, yes. I, I think I agree with that as well. Because it's sort of, there is some new language in there. Good. Okay. We're on the same page. That's good. So I'm going to move on a little bit. So I am conscious of time. So I'm, I'm trying to just show you lots of different variations and varieties of different types of tasks that we can go through. Um, front loading the lesson here. So we're moving on. Um, to another, another topic now. When content is new and you think that your students are not going to know this content, then often that means we need to front load the lesson a lot more. And by that we mean activating prior knowledge, building background, previewing the text if there is one, setting a purpose for reading and making connections and personalizing when we can. So I'm going to show you an example taken from geography. And the textbook has, has this picture here, and all, as a way of maybe starting with um, starting with uh, quadrant one, what the students already know, and front loading, we can start asking students some questions. So here we've got how many people can you see? So that's very 
simple for the students to do that. Who are these people? Are they in a swimming pool? How do you know? When was the photograph taken? Winter, summer, daytime, weekend. What are the children doing? And how do the children feel? So here we're, the questions are getting more and more challenging um, cognitively, if you like, in terms of the, the way the students are thinking. And this is taken from, well, here we got content aims, which would include to in, actually to in, in, enhance understanding of the effects of flooding is what the lesson is from. Also to practice the skill of reading a photograph, which, um, which I think is quite, quite a cool thing to, to consider. Reading is not just about reading words or reading a text, but also reading pictures and encouraging students to be able to do that. Um, something that is transferable to different subjects. We also have cognitive aims here, um, develop thinking skills, um, and how we can layer questions so they become more challenging. And then also, um, through visual imagery, trying to increase students' range of, of um, vocabulary. From a cultural aspect, we're also trying to develop students' ability to empathize. So have a look at these questions. Um, when does the thinking level, when does the thinking level begin to rise? When does it get more challenging? Uh, which question? Five, okay, four. Yeah, so when we're talking about when, does, at what point do the students have to start speculating? Yes, and so if they start speculating, are they in a swimming pool? That's no, but I think we can see that as a factual question. But how do you know? Now you're asking students to speculate. So from four, it's starting to get more and more um, the, the consciousness, well, the, uh, the cognitive um, is, uh, demand is getting higher. Let's have a look then at five. And now five, we're, we're trying to, again, we're trying to encourage the students to think more critically or think more carefully and in more depth. The questions are more open-ended. And we can support them with that, with vocabulary. So we can give them these topics, weather, light, clothing, and landscape, and we can brainstorm some words that go in there to help them, um, to help them respond to the question more successfully. So different types of words um, that can go in there might be, oh, same slide, might be, um, we got, some here, so weather, sunlight, temperature, cloud, this could be elicited from the students. Exactly, yeah, building vocabulary, thank you, um, Rima. Rima. Um, light, um, we've got dawn, midday, sunlight, evening, twilight, um, we've got clothing, swimming costumes, shoes, shorts, so this is giving the students more vocabulary in order to be able to talk about the picture. Question six, we can give them a frame to be able to describe the picture from a, from a grammatical point of view. Um, these are useful sentence starters. They are sitting and then the students can complete the phrases. So this is, again, building their linguistic abilities. Useful for all students. With frame seven, framing the question seven, how do they feel? We can start, again, building students' range of vocabulary so that they can express themselves in more depth and, as I mentioned, with greater range. So students, when you could give them the frame, they are or they are not, and then the students can complete that and then add because and so on. So moving more deeply, um, we've got why do they feel this way and what is the title of the picture? So holding the title of the picture back doesn't influence the students in terms of how they're going to discuss the picture. Um, if you were giving, giving it a title, and, that, and again, I think for time, I'll just go through this. Um, here we see the title, Children Swimming in Flood Water. Um, and what these, quest these seven questions that we uh, have briefly looked at are trying to do is we're focusing on the visual elements of the picture, what is factual, but also what students feel as well, and really 
provoking that to get a response. Um, a follow-up task here for, for homework, um, let's say, could be to, to describe the picture to a friend. Um, and at this point, you might decide to scaffold this or provide a framework to help the students use words and vocabulary in order to do that. And I have an example of that here. Um, so here's a frame of, of, that students can use. Not every column here will actually work and make an accurate sentence, but this is something that they can put piece together that they have to then use to support what they've been doing with the questions. Following this sort of progress, front-loading the lesson and having this progression of tasks and progression from factual to inferential is going to help the students perform the task much more successfully. If you just give them the picture to start with and say discuss the picture, they won't have the vocabulary or the background knowledge in order to be able to do it successfully. Writing using vocabulary. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's a good idea. Just looking in the chat box. And there's some time to teach you present purpose. Yes, yeah, definitely. So you can see certain grammatical structures come out in order to, that you can focus on with the, with the learners. So very quickly, when you, when, you get to see te when you see text, there's this hierarchy, which I always find quite helpful. Um, we've got continuous text, and as you move up through the schooling, that continuous text becomes more dense. You may see text with bullet points, tables, diagrams, and then we have visuals. Obviously, visuals, bullet points, tables are much easier to access and continuous text. That's when it gets more and more difficult. So when you're creating that progression of activity, bearing that in mind, because your textbook may not bear it in mind, that you can actually make things more accessible by reducing your activities to these different types of texts. As an example, you probably can't read that and you don't have to, because um, I just want to show you what you can, as an example, you might take a text from your book that is, again, is quite dense, and as a way around that, you take each sentence and you write it out separately like this. And this becomes much more inviting to the reader to, and is much more accessible. In this particular activity, I encourage the students to read through each of the sentences from the different paragraphs and identify whether it was a main idea or a supporting idea, which led into more paraphrasing and summarizing. But this is an example you can do really at many different levels or ages, stages of, of learning, where if you have a text, you can break it up into nice, simple sentences. That's a great way to plan out their own writing, detailed understanding from the main idea. Exactly, yeah. It just looks friendlier. And, uh, and once you go through a text like this, it's not that many sentences. I think it was just one page of, of letter-sized paper. Um, and then you can take out some of the language from the text as well, and they can match this up um, as a way of uh, in, in developing their academic language, but also as a way of increasing the range that students have and a way of talking about something in a different way. So a remarkable building, one of the most extraordinary buildings, um, is the largest mud brick building. Um, where's that one gone? Thank you, the largest building of mud brick, and so on. So you can see they're, they're getting different ways of saying the same thing from the text. Highlight and familiar vocabulary. Yes, yeah. And if you do it within context, that makes it much more memorable, memorable for them as well. Um, and then a hierarchy, in a similar way, of, there's a hierarchy of texts, or, and there's a hierarchy of task types, and these follow your... Um, lower order thinking skills to higher order thinking skills. Labeling, in a way, what we did with the, um, with the planets is, is a lower order thinking skill. We increase the demand by having the running dictation and then the students figuring out how to label it. We, so we made it a problem solving task. Um, but then moving all the way up to deciding the best practice or outcome is, a, is more of a higher order thinking skill. And so thinking about what is it that I'm trying to do where does it fall on this um, is going to help you decide whether it's a, where it falls into that matrix of, of tasks and how difficult it is. So basically what we're doing here is we're thinking what are the content demands of a task? We're thinking what are the language needs? 
And it's often good, a good idea to think, well, how am I going to assess it? And how do these first two relate to assessment? How are we doing for time? Five, About five, five minutes. minutes. Okay. Five. So I'm just going to race through this one then. Where are we? Another one about architecture here is the topic. And I just wanted to show you this just because um, it, was from, it was from a page from a book that I was using with some students not so long ago, a, a few, well, a couple of years ago. And it was introducing the topic of architecture by telling, telling the students really um, what they thought is what I looked at it. I looked at these pictures and probably with the exception of the middle one, I didn't know these other buildings. Um, so there was a, a lot on that page that I thought would be unfamiliar to the students. So as a way around that, oh, and this is a, a continuation of the material. It says, which of these buildings have you, um, I'm trying to think, have you seen? Um, which of these pictures have you, which of these have you seen? What do you know about the buildings? And so I looked at these questions myself and thought, I don't know a lot about these buildings. This is going to dry up very quickly. So as a way around that, I decided to choose buildings from the countries of the students in the classroom. So as you, can, you might recognize number three. Um, the other buildings came from Japan, the Middle East, um, China, South Korea. And uh, we had more buildings than this, but they were all representative of, the, of buildings that were going to be completed or in the process of being completed. I think it was in 2014 or 2015. Um, and then priming as a way to warm up. Now the questions were more relevant. What do you like about each building? What do you dislike? Do you know any of the buildings? And now as a group, the students, there were students in there that did know about the buildings. So again, it's focusing on what students already know. This opinion survey was developed um, from that paragraph. If I just go back here, this paragraph, oh, pointer, there we go. This paragraph here, which was just explanation, was turned into an opinion survey. So buildings surround us and are important parts of our lives. But do you agree? Don't just tell the students that this is a fact. Ask them if they agree. Have a scale of one to four so no one can sit on the fence. Um, and then this way they, do, they answer the questions themselves individually. You can regroup them and you can generate quite an engaging activity. Um, especially, I think, with the, the last one, modern buildings are far more varied and interesting than they were, than what was previously possible. So those, these types of things tap into what students already know. Um, and then just to kind of follow on from that, personalization, which we mentioned briefly earlier. In, again, tapping into what students already believe. This is your opinion gap and their feelings. What makes a good building? Writing at least three things. So some students, the outcome is to write three, but maybe um, other students can write more. And then at the same time, useful vocabulary, which is not often a focus um, of, of materials. So you might have to, in a way, what we call mine text or mine information so that you can pick out these useful phrases, again, to develop um, their vocabulary range. And a lot of these here may apply to diff more than one of the buildings. So a reflective surface is clearly two, three, and four. We've got a donut there, which is the one in the middle. Um, skyscraper is one of the key words, and so on. So again, you're finding every opportunity to increase students' range of language. From this, we moved into more of an internet project, where students can use tablets or their own devices, excuse me, with internet access, so them they can check online for information, it can be either an English site or a site in their own language, if you have um, inter um, English language learners in there. And then here was, here was the task. What is the name of the building? Uh, where is it? And so on. And the students can make their notes uh, in English and then prepare to present that to the class. I think I'm 
I'm getting low on time now, aren't I? So, and so our target task here, regroup and talk about the building. Um, and then as we mentioned, with task-based teaching, even when you get to this report at the end, you, want the, you still want students to have a purpose or a reason to listen to each other. So what is the most interesting fact about the building? This is what the students are listening to when their uh, peers are telling each other about their, their building. Okay, and so a summary then, just to wrap up. So a checklist for uh, designing tasks. Is there a primary focus on meaning? So is communication important? Is, it, what, is there some kind of gap? And we've looked at some information gap, opinion gaps, and reasoning gaps today. Is there a defined outcome? My slides are getting mixed up. There we go. And uh, that was the last one. Yeah, so it, these, are, these are the questions that you can ask yourself. And if you can say yes to these questions, then you are on track with a, with a, with a more of a task in the definition that we, we talked about earlier. OK, so I did race through those, those last few tasks. And uh, Chris, me. So, um, so no. So that's as I mentioned, we were raced through quite quickly there. And uh, if you have any questions, I will try my best to answer them. Um, but I'll take this opportunity to thank you for attending. So at this point, we'll field any questions in the chat box if you would like to type or. I'd like to use your microphone, jump on, and be very bold, answer a question verbally. Thanks, Millie. Thanks. Thank you. So th thank you, everyone, for joining us on this web webinar. Um, we're, we're hoping to have some more webinars in the future, so stay tuned. Thank you again for joining us. Lots of cool. Light. Oh, good. Thank you, uh, Jennifer. And you'll be able to find the presentation deck and the, the, um, the recording of the webinar on the Moodle site.